Hi, I'm Carrie Figdor from the University of Iowa, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about neuroscience and folk psychology, uh, where our basic question is, are you your brain? So this is part of the Be Beginner's Guide to Neural Mechanisms. Um, the content of today's lecture, uh, basically three questions. Um, first of all, what is folk psychology? Um, and what are the controversies uh, in relation to which uh, neuroscience and folk psychology intersect? Um, second of all, how is folk psychology related to various conceptions of who we are, how we explain action, um, how we uh, hold each other responsible for what we do? Um, and then thirdly, what is the emerging picture regarding the relation between folk psychology and uh, neuroscience, and specifically cognitive neuroscience? Right? How is that changing how we can think of ourselves and how we explain and understand each other? So there's four segments. Uh, the first segment will be the basics of folk psychology. What is it? What does it do? How do we understand and explain each other's actions? Uh, the second part will be folk psychology and the brain, basic mind-body problem, in effect. Um, and there the question is, how, how are the mental states of folk psychology related to the brain? Uh, you know, basically from a pre-theoretic perspective. The third is the key implications of whichever the relation we think is best. Um, and these involve the self, who are you, and action and the, and the uh, holding of people responsibility f uh, responsible for their actions. Um, and the fourth is the impact of neuroscience, and particularly cognitive neuroscience, uh, on the mental states of folk psychology. And essentially, what is neuroscience telling us about our intuitive way of thinking about ourselves? So the first segment right, the basics of folk psychology. How do we understand and explain each other's actions? Well, I'll start a few steps before we get to folk psychology. Um, so the idea here is that um, we think about other things, uh, people, but also objects, animals, all kinds of things. Uh, we tend to think of them in terms of animacy uh, or being alive in some way and then agency in terms of doing something. And so the question, the initial question is, well, what is it to perceive something as animate? Uh, and what is it to perceive it as an agent? And what you have here is a short animated film by two psychologists, Heider and Simmel. Um, if you play that video for about, it's about an, a minute and a half, um, you'll see the, the triangle and the circle the tr both triangles and the circle move around in various ways. Um, and when you do that, when you watch what they do, you'll be inclined to ascribe to the triangles and to the circles various sorts of mental states, like the bigger triangle wants to do something to the smaller triangle, the smaller triangle is responding with fear or with some sort of aversion to the larger triangle. Um, and so forth, right? So if you take a moment to watch the video, you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, once you've done that, right, you have an idea of what it is to ascribe mental states to another object, right? But obviously, in the case of the video, we're just talking about triangles and circles, right? Um, which says something important, which I'll mention again later. Um, but f we can now get to the idea of an action, right? If the, um, what is an action? Um, well, basically it's something, what something does, right? Uh, rather than what is done to it, right? So if you think of a tree that is blown by the wind, the tree is, has something done to it, but if it falls on a car and it smashes the car, the car has done something to the car, right? But of course, that's not necessarily the sort of action that we're interested in when we're talking about folk psychology. What we're interested in are the actions of agents, right? So for example, uh, a person who is kicking a ball, right, is an agent who deliberately or intentionally is kicking the ball. Or they could kick the ball unintentionally. But in either case, it's an agent doing something rather than just the, as with the tree, the tree 
causing the car to be crushed, but not necessarily having any intentions in doing it. And so if we talk about the intentional actions of agents, right, which is what we're interested in, we're talking about, in particular, the sorts of things that you would choose to do, actions that, as we say, you own, um, actions that you can be held responsible for. So for example, you could choose to break a glass and then let go of it over a hard surface, um, or you can drop the glass uh, thinking it will not break, not intending to break it, but it does happen to break, right? So in the one case, you have intended to break the, cl the glass, and in the other case, it breaks, and you did it, and you can be held responsible for it, but you didn't intend to do it, right? So our main goal with folk psychology is to explain the intentional actions of agents, right? Such as you deliberately, intentionally breaking the class by dropping it. So that gets us a little bit far, uh, closer to folk psychology. Um, so to understand what I mean when I say the explanatory role of mental states, uh, it's important to realize that this is actually a cognitive achievement that most people attain at approximately the age three to five, right? So let's say four as the median, right? And before the age of four, roughly speaking, or, or three, uh, children or infants are generally not able to pass what's called the false belief task. Whereas after the age of you know, three to five, they do pass. And of course, we as adults do pass as well, right? So what is the false belief task? Well, this is a storyboard of one of the basic uh, uh, experiments done in false belief task experiments. Um, in this case, you have one figure, Sally, and then another figure, Anne. They both have a box. Sally has a ball. She puts the ball in the box. Anne is watching. Sally then goes away. Anne watches her go away. Then Anne takes the ball from Sally's box and puts it in her own box and then leaves. Then Sally comes back. And now the question is, does the child correctly predict where Sally will look for the ball? So as adults, we would, we would say, well, the ball was switched. Sally doesn't know that the ball was switched in its location, so she's going to look in her own box. She'll have a false belief about where the ball is. A child below the age of roughly three to four will not, will not answer that way. Typically, they will say that Sally will look where the child herself or himself knows the ball has been hidden, so she will look in Anne's box, which is where the child will look, but shouldn't be where Sally will look. So in this particular case, what, what you or what the child ascribe to Sally is a false belief that the ball is in her box, right? Or you're unable to do that. And in this particular case, the mental state of believing that the ball is in the box right, guides her behavior about what she does. So this is what we mean by this explanatory role of mental states, right? We're explaining intentional actions of agents, Sally, an agent, intentionally looking for her ball, right? Folk psychology is the theory or framework of beliefs, desires, intentions, and other mental states that we cite when we're explaining or predicting our actions or the actions of other agents. It's also called common sense psychology, belief, desire, intention psychology, propositional attitude psychology. I will just call it folk psychology. And that definition is roughly the classical view. So there's been more recent developments of folk psychology that hold, first of all, it's not just beliefs and desires and intentions. Uh, it includes decisions, plans, character, motives, emotions, and so forth. Uh, there's also arguments that it's not the only way in which we uh, understand each other, right? Or that we use for social interaction generally. 
There are many methods, for example, of mutual interaction between people, many of which are not verbal at all, which don't involve the ascription of mental states. Um, and thirdly is the idea that, that even folk psychology is not just for uh, predicting and explaining other people's behavior, right? It also involves what some people call regulating or shaping each other's behavior, right? Getting them to do, act or do things, right? By ascribing to them certain ways of thinking, right? So folk psychology in the classic sense is more narrowly just belief, desire, and intention used to explain and predict behavior. We'll just assume that sort of basic view for the rest of the, of the, uh, of the lecture because it does, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. So what does all of this have to do with neuroscience? Well, basic question, what are these mental states, right? It's not like you look at them, find them in the woods like trees, or find them in your house like cups, right? They're mental states, right? So what are they? Um, and you might think, well, maybe we have beliefs, desires, intentions, and so forth in the brain, right? Or maybe there isn't anything in the brain that is a belief or a desire or an intention, right? So what are the basic options here? Um, and I say ontological options because we're talking about what exists, right? If, if beliefs exist, what are they? 